Let's start by learning more about JavaScript core internals. I base this video a lot on Saelo's frag paper attacking JavaScript engines, or more specifically the parts where he introduces some internals. However, I hope I'm adding to it by playing around with it using the debug version of JavaScript core, which we have compiled last video. Anyway, remember last video when we created an array of integers and even found them in memory? We found 1, 2, 3, 4, but they also had this weird FFFF in the highest bits. So what's up with that? Let's start by looking at the C++ source code of the JavaScript core engine. This series on browser exploitation is supported by SSD Secure Disclosure. Check out the description for more information. A very important class that is used to handle a lot of values in JavaScript is the class JSValue. We can find the class definition in the file jsc.jsValue.h, class JSValue. If we look at it, we can see that this generic class seems to be able to handle various different kinds of JavaScript types. The class JSValue has functions that can check if it is an integer, an unsigned integer, a double, or if it's a boolean, true and false. We can also see here if this JS value is not an object, this call to get object shall return zero. Otherwise it returns an address to a JS object. And when we scroll a bit further, we find a compiler if, which describes a JS value on a 32-bit system or a JS value on a 64-bit system. Because basically everything is 64-bit nowadays, let's focus on that. On 64-bit platforms, use JSValue64 should be defined and we use a none encoded form for intermediates. Intermediates are just values like a number. And here we find this nice graphics that tells us what this none encoding is. So if our JSValue is a pointer, so a regular address pointing somewhere, the highest 16-bit, 2 bytes, are 0, 0. And the remaining bytes are just the pointer address. On the other hand, 32-bit signed integers are marked with the 16-bit tag FFFF. And this explains why we saw these FFFF in memory for our integers. Doubles, so floating point numbers, are everything in between. There are a few more special values that are important, and that is false, which will be hex 6, true is a 7, undefined would be a hex A, and null would be a 2. Let's look at this in memory. So here I have JSC open with LLDB debugger and I'm creating a new array A. I start with an integer, then a double, false, undefined, true, null, an empty object, and another integer. Cool. Then we type describe A to get the address of the butterfly. Now we can hit Ctrl C to break into the debugger and then examine memory. 8 64-bit hex values starting from the butterfly address. Here we go. Hmm, the integer hex1337 looks weird though. This is not an integer. If we continue again with C and then use describe to look at this first element of our array, we see that it is actually a double now. Huh? If we create this array step by step and examine it with describe, we can kind of see what happened. So here I create the list, then I print the description of the array itself, and then the description of the first element. When we only have the single integer in the array, then the first value is a 32-bit integer. Right now it's still an array with 32-bit integers. But as soon as we add the float, the first element also becomes a double. And then the whole array is now a double array. However, when we add weird elements like false, it actually becomes now a generic contiguous array and the first element is an integer again. But adding now undefined to the array, it somehow is now a double again. You see, the JavaScript engine does quite some crazy stuff to arrays depending on the elements you put into it. Anyway, if we go back to our whole array, we can now understand that the JavaScript engine decided to convert the first integer to a double, and this is also a double. In the last video, I also quickly showed you that you can convert this double to a raw bytes and vice versa. And we will actually implement this for JavaScript as well because that is really helpful for exploitation. Anyway, here we see the special other values like false, undefined, true, and null. This here is our object. Well, it's not directly the object. From our JS value definition, we see that this encodes a pointer. 
So this is an address pointing to the empty object in memory. And our last element actually is a proper integer with the FFF. Cool, but what is up with this butterfly? What does that mean? Let's do another test. Here is an empty array A and it is currently in memory located here and it has a butterfly here. Now let's push two integers into this array and look again. The address didn't change, so it wasn't reallocated or something. The adding of new elements did something else. Let's look at the first address. The bad B values here can be ignored, these are just added because of the debug build, so if something crashes it can help with debugging. Typically they would be zero, so our only important values are those here. This is an address and this is pointing to a butterfly. And the hex 61 is actually 97, so that is the structure ID of this object. I think the other values are some flags describing some things about this particular object. Anyway, let's look again at the butterfly and we can find our two pushed integers. Now let's play a bit more with the array. Let's use a typical JavaScript feature, which is we can just define some new properties on this. Like any object, we can assign new properties. So let's do a property B, set it to three, and a property C and set it to four. Then describe A. Now the butterfly address has changed. So it looks like JavaScript core reallocated that. And also the structure ID was updated and our object has now two properties. It's still an array with int 32 though. Let's look at the object in memory again. That looks still similar, except of course the structure ID and the butterfly address changed. And the butterfly still looks the same. So where are our properties? This is where the butterfly got its name from. This address actually doesn't point like usually at the start of something, but points into a middle. The frag paper has a graphics that makes this clear. To the right, so where the pointer is pointing to, we have two elements if it's an array. But actually before that we have the length of the array and the properties. So if we subtract a bit from the address and look before it, we can actually find our two properties. Or more specifically, the values of the properties, 3 and 4. And here's the length of our array. It has two elements. Cool. Now instead of an array, let's do some things but start with an empty object. And then we create two properties B and C. If we describe this object now, we notice that it doesn't have a butterfly pointer. How can that be if the butterfly stores properties? Well, if we examine memory, we actually find the properties right in the object itself. They have been inlined right into the JS object itself. However, if we add a few more properties and keep checking with describe, eventually, once we have more than six, we actually now get a butterfly. If we print the memory of the butterfly, the part where usually array elements are, is empty. If we print the object itself, we find six of the properties. However, the seventh one was placed in the property part of the butterfly. So we have to subtract a bit of this address again and here it is. Now how does JavaScript core keep track of the properties? As you know, the properties have names and are somehow accessed through that name or string. But it doesn't appear to be in this object. This is where the structure ID comes into play. The structure ID always describes the structure of an object. So the structure ID 302 describes the layout of an object with the properties B, C, D, E, F, G and H. If we use these properties, nothing changes. However, if we change the structure of the object, for example by adding another property i, JavaScript core has to create a new structure to describe it. And now our object has structure ID 303. If we look again at the frag paper, we can also find this neat graphic generally describing the larger picture of these classes and objects in memory. So an array is also a JS object, but the highest class is the JS cell, and it points to a structure which describes the properties. We have actually seen that also in the describe debug output. Property B was at offset 0 inlined, C was at offset 1 inlined, and so forth, and the properties that are in the butterfly have this special base value of 100 to indicate that they are not inlined. So butterfly offset 0, butterfly offset 1. The actual entry of the structure in the structure table referenced by the structure ID also contains a class info and holds a method table, which contains information about the functions that exist for this object. One last tip. We can also use LLDB thanks to the debug symbols to pretty print the JS object from this address. And then we can see that it's inheriting from JS cell and here's the structure ID and some information on what these other special flags mean. 
For example, cell state is important for the garbage collector. The cell state of a cell is a kind of hint about what the state of the cell is. And it might have different values if the garbage collector is scanning the objects to free. Now we have a good understanding of how JavaScript objects and values are represented in memory by JavaScript core. And you also have the ability to investigate and look around yourself. Next part, we will have the first look at the JavaScript interpreter and the JIT, the just-in-time compiler. Thanks again to SSD Secure Disclosure for supporting this series. Check out their website and learn more about the SSD Vulnerability Disclosure program at ssddisclosure.com.